the terms so I know it's sometimes a challenge to get motivated or maybe more realistically to find time to come to special events like this. But I think this is uh, going to be a really enriching experience. I'm delighted to have our two speakers and make this essentially the launch of a lecture series by the Public History Institute focused on uh, fighting for civil rights in America and the West. So for today's program, which is going to be a concise 75 minutes, we have two 30-minute talks followed by some questions time for discussion as well, I hope. And with just quick introductions, I want to begin with uh, Lori Weir, who is a state park interpreter for 11 state parks, I believe, in California. She's an alumna of CSUB spent about 10 years as an archaeologist before moving on to work at the Kern County Museum for 21 years. A very long time there. I know she was a curator and as a Bakersfield native is very intimately um, tuned into Bakersfield history and was a huge asset there. So she tells me it was a difficult decision to leave, but uh, she found a new challenge working for the state parks where she has been for about three and a half years. So she's going to lead off our program by talking about Allen's work and focusing at least some on the connections between this African American community that was started in the early 20th century and Bakersfield itself. So welcome, Lori, and thank you so much for being here. And I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever, show of hands, uh, heard of Allen's work? Oh, a lot of people. Okay, that's great. So Allensworth is located in southwestern Tulare County. It's about oh, 10 miles uh, northwest, I mean, uh, sorry, northeast of Delano. You can see it here, <coughs> adjacent to the old Tulare Lake bed. And you can just take a note of all of the rivers in that area and how much water is in that location. Uh, this is Colonel Allen Allensworth. He was born into slavery in Louisville, Kentucky on April 7, 1842. At the age of 12 years old, he was sold away from his mother, Phyllis, for having attempted to learn to read and write, um, something that blacks were prohibited by law from doing. In 1855, at the age of 13, he decided to run away because of the harsh treatment he received at the hands of the plantation's overseer. He was discovered, however, and sold at auction to a slave dealer in Henderson, Kentucky for $960. He was taken to Memphis, Tennessee and offered for sale at the price of $1,200. After being confined with more than 1,000 other slaves, he was purchased by a man named Fred Scruggs, a horse uh, and slave trader. He was trained to be a racehorse rider. And Scruggs moved his horses and slaves to Louisville in anticipation of the upcoming horse races. But when the Union forces um, during the Civil War neared Louisville, the races were canceled. Allensworth fled behind Union lines and was found qualified to work as a nurse attached to the hospital corps of the 44th Illinois. So he was able to disguise himself and escape his enslavement by uh, going behind the Union forces lines. In April of 1863, he joined the U.S. Navy and rose from the rank of first-class seaman to first-class petty officer. Uh, he was honorably discharged from the U.S. Navy in 1865, after which he worked in the commissary of the Mount City Navy Yard. In 1867, he and his brother opened two restaurants in St. Louis, which were tremendously successful, but Allensworth sold the restaurants and joined the Baptist Church. He was, ordained, he was an ordained minister, uh, receiving that title in 1871 and held several pastorates in Kentucky and Ohio. In 1882, a black soldier urged him to use his influence to secure the appointment of African American chaplains of regular army regiments as the Buffalo Soldiers. Learning that the chaplain of the all-black 24th Infantry would be retiring, Allensworth was appointed on April 1st, 1886 by President Grover Cleveland as chaplain of the U.S. Army's 24th Infantry with the rank of captain. In 1906, Colonel Allensworth retired from the U.S. Army with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. 
At the time, he was the highest ranking African American in the US military. Throughout his long and illustrious career, he was stationed at several camps in the United States and the Indian Territory and participated in the Spanish American War and the Philippine Liberation. Not only did he take care of African American soldiers' <laughs> spiritual well being, he was also responsible for teaching them English and seeing to their moral education and entertainment. After retiring, Colonel Allensworth traveled extensive, extensively throughout the Midwestern and Eastern states, lecturing on the need for African Americans to initiate programs of self help so that they might become economically, socially, culturally, and politically self-sufficient, promoting the ideas of Booker T. Washington, Washington, a man that he had corresponded with over the years. Noticing that hundreds, if not thousands, of blacks were migrating to California to avoid the segregation policies and practices of the South and the de facto discriminatory policies and practices of the North, Colonel Allensworth also decided to go west. He retired to Los Angeles in 1906. His dream was to establish a community for African Americans free from the discrimination and violence of the Jim Crow era. A dream he had nurtured for many years because of his own experiences and those of other African Americans of the vilest forms of discrimination and violence. He was touched by the condition of black people with whom he was surrounded and his pity, his indignation at the injustices that they had to endure, his zeal for their relief and improvement, and his remarkable self-control under many provocations gave him a desire to alleviate the plight of his fellow African Americans. Hearing that land was very rich and readily available in the southern portion of the San Joaquin Valley, Colonel Allensworth investigated and found the land to be extremely fertile, land costs reasonable, surface water in the form of artesian wells and flowing rivers abundant, and underground water tables exceedingly high. Returning to Los Angeles, Colonel Allensworth, along with several others, founded the California Colony and Home Promoting Association. Um, <clears throat> with Colonel Allensworth as the president, the association's plans were developed to establish an all-black community in the southwest corner of Tulare County. The community became a reality on August 3rd, 1908, with the filing of the township site plan, an article in the Tulare Register newspaper um, noted, the town, which is to be called Allensworth, is to enable colored people to live on equity with whites and to encourage industry and th thrift in the race. And this is a map showing the, um, the site plan of the various tracks. Now, the park uh, that is currently uh, part of the California State Park system is actually just this portion here. This still remains the living community of Allensworth. So there are still people that live in, an, in the township of Allensworth, or Hamlet as they call it. Uh, and this is a newspaper article. Um, I'll read it just briefly. It says, well explain Negro colonization. Uh, there's quite a few ties between Allensworth and Bakersfield. A lot of people moved from Bakersfield to live in Allensworth, and Colonel Allensworth and another gentleman who were the major recruiters for the town to try to get people to move there, they both spoke in Bakersfield frequently. And this is uh, one article from 1909 in the Bakersfield, California. Colonel Allen Allensworth, U.S. Army, retired, will deliver an address tonight at the Second, Second Baptist Church, zero, uh, O and 13th Street, on the working of the National School of Citizenship, Artistic Homemaking, and Scientific Farming, which is being put into operation at the Negro Colony at Salida. Salida is the name of the town that, was, that existed, or the railroad stop, prior to Allensworth. Um... 42 miles north of here. Colonel Allensworth spent some time today in interviewing local merchants, discussing with them the prospects of the colonization project. The 4,000 and more acres which have been secured will be colonized by the system represented by Colonel Allensworth. His partner in crime, as it were, was a man named William Payne. 
Uh, William Payne was born in West Virginia in 1877, so he is 35 years uh, Colonel Allensworth Jr., but they were kindred spirits in their um, love of education and uh, furthering of African Americans as a race. His father, Frank, was a coal miner. His mother, Lavinia, worked as a homemaker and teacher. He graduated from Denison University in Granville, Ohio, in 1906. That same year, he married Zenobia Jones and moved to Pasadena, where his parents had settled earlier. He met Colonel Allensworth, and the two men, along with William Peck, Harry Mitchell, John Palmer, uh, the, both the five of them formed the California Colony and Home Promoting Association. Professor Payne would teach at the Allensworth School from 1910 to 1919. The children who attended the two-room school in Allensworth admired and respected Professor Payne. He later took a teaching position in El Centro, moving with his family to the desert town around 1920. He passed away in 1854 at the age of 76 in Los Angeles. Uh, William Payne didn't let the grass grow under his feet. He was very busy throughout his time at Allensworth. He served as not only the co-founder of the town of Allensworth, the principal and teacher, recruiter to bring people to Allensworth, a speaker or orator, an enumerator for the 1920 U.S. Census at Allensworth, and as a registrar during World War I for the draft. And this is, again, an article out of the Bakersfield, California, and the last line says, Professor W. Payne of Allensworth will deliver the oration for a celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation. This is a bird's eye view of Allensworth in 1915, taken from a grain um, storage building adjacent to the Santa Fe Railroad tracks. So you can see the appeal of Allensworth. This two sections of the town were uh, under the former lake of Tulare Lake. So in theory, you would think that there would be fertile soil. Um, it's adjacent to the Santa Fe Railroad tracks. So just to give you some um, sort of frame of reference, the first automobile was purchased in Bakersfield in 1906, and Allensworth was founded in 1908. So the automobile was not something that was used heavily for travel. People took the train. And its location in the train not only allowed people to come and go, but it also allowed any commodities that they um, produced through agriculture or dairies and things like that, they could ship them off to market on the train as well. <clears throat> this is the Mary Dickinson Memorial Library. This is. Um, this was originally the first schoolhouse in Allensworth. Uh, the rapid growth of Allensworth necessitated the establishment of public services. The first of these was the Allensworth Rural Water Company, which was established, established in 1908. The next service that was started in the community was the Allensworth School District. The first classes had been held in the home of James Hackett as early as 1909, but in 1910, the people of Allensworth secured a county school through the county superintendent of schools, and in that same year, the first schoolhouse was built, which is this building. <coughs> the school was a regular county school with one teacher. The colony chose Professor William Payne as the principal and teacher. Oscar O'Bear donated the lumber for the building, and the Alpha School District supplied money to pay the teacher's salary. The size of the classes soon made it necessary for the town to build a larger two-room two -room schoolhouse in 1912. The former school building became the Mary Dickinson Memorial Library and Reading Room, named for Josephine Allensworth, so that's Colonel Allensworth's wife, um, for her mother. Josephine Allensworth donated the land that the building was moved to, so they just picked this up and moved it over about a quarter of a mile. Uh, she also paid to remodel and redecorate the building, making it suitable for a library. Um, the books in the inside were donated by her husband, and then the Tulare County Library System would also send books quarterly by train. This is Josephine Allensworth. Um, she made substantial contributions to the town's social development. She founded several women's clubs. 
She served as a member of the first Allensworth School Board and participated in the Women's Improvement Association. And her support of the library really provided the uh, community with tremendous opportunities. So you could read the local papers, um, you could do research if you were uh, one of the school children or one of the residents of the town. And this is the Allensworth's home. So they lived most of the time in Los Angeles. They had a um, two-story house down in LA, but this was kind of their vacation home and they could stay here. This was just a one bedroom house, four rooms total. Um, and it was a kit home. Uh, so Colonel Allensworth and his wife bought this lot in 1910 from the Pacific Farming Company. And they're the ones that helped, that provided the land to the California colony and Home Promoting Association. Um, this house arrived in pieces by railroad and was transported to this particular lot and assembled on site. This is two-room schoolhouse that was built in 1912. And the woman at the far right, Margaret Prince, is one of the first teachers at Allensworth to work with um, Professor Payne in the two-room schoolhouse. So the population increased such that from 1910 to 1912, they needed to have go from a one-room schoolhouse to a two-room schoolhouse. These are some of the school children, um, and a later librarian would be Bertie Phillips, and you can see two of her children here. Uh, Bertie's husband, James, they moved to Allensworth, and within two years, her husband passed away. So she was left with his military pension of about $12 a month to live on and raise her five kids. Uh, she was able to get a job working in the library as the librarian, and so it's kind of a really great setup because literally, the school and the library are maybe a quarter of a mile away. So you can imagine as a single parent, this is a great opportunity for her, for kids to come over and study at the library after they got done with school or they could go home and do their chores. And this is their daughter, Irene. Um, and you can see the Allensworths home in the background there. So this is the back side. They were neighbors of the Allensworths. This is Mary Jane Vickers and her husband, Reverend Everett, Edward Everett Vickers. Uh, she owned the first store and post office and operated the first post office in Allensworth. She was a Bakersfield resident. Her brother was already living in Allensworth. His name was William Hall. And she and her husband ended up um, separating and ultimately getting a divorce. And she moved to Allensworth with her son in 1909. <clears throat> she was born in Alabama in 1877 and came to California with her parents, Willis and Jane Hall. The Hall family is really well known in Bakersfield. Uh, one of her uh, brothers, Mansion Hall, uh, married Susie Pinckney, and the Pinckney house is at the Kern County Museum. Um, <clears throat> she moved to Allensworth uh, again in 1909. And unfortunately, she passed away in 1918. We're currently doing some research to determine if we can find out when she passed away. Uh, we haven't been successful in finding her obituary, but it would be interesting to know if she succumbed to the Spanish flu epidemic at that time. She was only 41 at the time of her death. This is her niece, Ethel Hall, who would become the first librarian of Allensworth. Um, Ethel served from July uh, 1913 to August of 1916. She was around 18 years old um, when she became the first librarian. She and her sister Helen moved to Bakersfield living with relatives while attending Kern County High School. So the school in Allensworth that didn't go through high school, um, she graduated from Kern County High School or what we know as Bakersfield High School in 1918. And this is her picture from her senior year. And a little quote that she wrote um, that accompanied her photo is, I, Ethel Hall, do leave, leave my studious disposition to anyone having need of it. This is the Singleton store. And you can see Joshua Singleton there in the white shirt. Uh, 
Um, Joshua Singleton and his wife Henrietta moved to Allensworth from Winfield, Kansas. His father, named Benjamin Pat Singleton, is fairly well-known African-American gentleman uh, who is known as an exoduster. So they, he left the South and went to Kansas. This was a kind of a stopover point for them. Um, in 1910, they moved to Allensworth and opened this store. Joshua had been a stone cutter in Kansas, but had to give that up due to poor health. Uh, Henrietta was a practicing nurse and midwife. Besides running the store and serving as a postmaster after Mary Jane Vickers had returned to Bakersfield, um, he organized an orchestra using a collection of stringed instruments that he owned. And sometimes orchestra practice would take place at the back of the store or at Frank Milner's barbershop, which was just uh, two buildings over. The Singleton store was in operation until Joshua Singleton passed away in 1928. So Allensworth actually had three stores, the Scott Gross Drug Store, the um, Singleton Store, and then the Heinzman and Company General Store. This by far is the largest store in Allensworth. The windows that you see here directly face the Santa Fe Railroad. This is a great marking ploy. People coming in on the railroad can look out the windows of the train and see the various goods there. They needed to stop off and pick up a few things or grab a bite to eat, they could do that. Uh, the Heinzmans arrived at Allensworth in 1911. And this is the longest running business in Allensworth. It was in business until the mid to late 40s. This is the Allensworth Hotel. It's a seven room hotel and it opened in 1910. Elizabeth Dowery, a wealthy African American businesswoman from Oakland, purchased the property and financed construction of the hotel. This was an investment property for her. She never actually lived in Allensworth or operated the hotel. She hired John and Clara Morris of Bakersfield as the managers of the hotel, which they operated until about 1915. And here you can see some of the residents of Allensworth. Sometimes dances were held inside the hotel on a Friday or Saturday night for the local residents. Uh, there were three churches in the town as well. This is the first Baptist church, but there was also a Methodist Zion church and a Seventh-day Adventist church. This is the only actual church building. The two other organizations um, were held either in the Allensworth School or in um, Joshua Singleton's home. This is a copy of the 1912 Great Register of Tulare County. And on October 10th, 1911, equal suffrage came before the California voters. The proposition was passed throughout the state by just 3,587 votes. This gave women the opportunity to vote in California, about <clears throat> eight years prior to women getting the vote nationally. In 1914, Allensworth was made a voting precinct, and Allensworth was one of the first voting precincts in California comprised entirely of African Americans. A woman named Lena Ashby was part of the first generation of African Americans born after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. Uh, she was born in March, and the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation was issued in January. Um, she was a resident of Allensworth when the proposition was passed, granting women the right to vote, and it was in the two-room schoolhouse that she voted for the very first time. This is Oscar and Cora Ober. Uh, Oscar, Oscar Ober had a plot of land where the agricultural potential of Allensworth was demonstrated to potential residents. So if you're coming from Cam Kansas, you may not be familiar with the irrigated um, agriculture that we practice in California. So we don't rely on rainfall. We have to irrigate crops. That was something that was new to a lot of people. So he could show the various crops that were you were able to grow in the area and how to irrigate. Uh, the townspeople of Allensworth elected him Justice of the Peace in 1914. He became the first African American to be elected to that position in the state of California. And like most of the other town members, he was a very strong believer in the notion of education as a means to improving 
African American's way of life. He donated uh, lumber for the construction of the first school in Allensburg. <coughs> this is William Dotson. William and Louise Dotson and their four children arrived in Allensworth in late 1911. Uh, Louise Dotson <coughs> signed the community's petition for the establishment of Tulare County Library Service in 1912, and she later offered and accepted a post as the community's librarian. The Dotsons came from Oakland, where they had been in business, William as a saloon keeper and Louise as a hairdresser. When the family moved to Allensworth, they um, sort of became entrepreneurs. They had a restaurant in the front of their house. And then William also earned a living as a laborer stacking sacks of wheat and other commodities in the grain warehouse adjacent to the railroad tracks. In the fall of 1914, um, after the establishment of the judicial, judicial district, he was elected constable. And in the later part of uh, the year, he bought the Elmer Carter livery uh, business. He finished his term as constable in 1918, and the family left Allensworth around 1920. There were several uh, things that happened that really impacted the pioneers and the recruitment at Allensworth. One of them was the death of Colonel Allensworth in 1914. He was walking across the street in Monrovia going to a church where he was going to preach when he was hit by a motorcycle. He fell down and had two broken legs and a skull fracture. At 72, he just was not able to recover from those injuries. And so the colonel passed away. Being one of two people that were the recruiters for the town, that made it really challenging to bring new people into the town, especially when William Payne was busy teaching and being a census taker and draft board registrar and things like that. Another issue was that there was a drought in California around that same time period. And so the artesian wells, which is where water just bubbles up to the surface, those dried up and disappeared beneath the ground. And so they were going to have to purchase expensive pumps to pump the water out of the ground. And that was something that they fought with the Pacific Farming Company over and ultimately won. And the Pacific Farming Company then had to install a few pumps, but after that they said no more. And so it really put a damper on the agriculture endeavors of the people in the community. The other thing is, you know, here you're getting into World War I. A lot of the men left and served overseas, and after World War I, you get this urbanization of America, um, where you get a lot of people from the community that moved up and worked in the shipyards in Alameda or moved down to LA for higher paying jobs. The other thing that um, impacted the town was now, you know, you're getting into the 20s and the automobile is much more popular. So you don't have to live within walking distance of where you're working or things like that. You're able to travel farther distances and in a quicker amount of time. So sometimes they say, you know, Allensworth, the town that wouldn't die. And in reality, it's not the town that ever died. There were always people living there until 1973 when California State Parks purchased the property. And that was because... Um, most of the pioneers left. That's why they say, you know, that there was a demise of the town of Allensworth. When in reality, it was just a lot of the pioneers that moved out. And now the community of Allensworth is 99% Hispanic. So the town has never gone away. It's always remained there since uh, 1908. But it's just the transitions that the town went through over that time period that really change the face of Colonel Allensworth's dream. But, you know, currently the state park, it's kind of an interesting uh, way that the park came about. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968 uh, caused people to really look at African American history throughout the country, including in California. And there was a group that lived um, in the community of Allensworth that formed a committee and really were able to provide all of the research necessary and uh, were able to make it happen that it became preserved as a state park, the historic district and a few of the residences of Allensworth. Um, and so in 1976, the town was dedicated at our country's bicentennial. So that's a very short time for the uh, park to become uh, established. 
from 1973 to 76. Usually, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the state, but it works very slowly. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, you know, even today, when the pandemic hit, we were giving virtual school tours of the town of Allensworth to students throughout the state. And I always think in, you know, the back of my mind that Colonel Allensworth would be thrilled to know that all these years after he passed away, he's still able to educate the um, students of our country. And so, um, I am wrapping it up. And if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. And I also brought some brochures. If anyone would like a brochure, please feel free to use them there at the back of the room. Thank you.
already had on a number of, even, this is not even a comprehensive list, but it, it organized, funded, sponsored, facilitated. Um, there's different accounts about a specific number of community search programs, but most historians estimate, you know, 20 and 30 different community service programs. All right. Thank <laughs> you. 
confronted with some some similar uh, social issues uh, on arriving in Hotel. That's the last one. I do. I don't have a slide for this, but and I don't need to be going faster. But I do want to just survey you guys. How many of you guys think that for the majority of the party's lifespan, it was mostly a male male organization, mostly male membership, nobody? Oh, that's good, because it wasn't. <laughs> and for a long time, that I think that has been the common narrative, that it was this male-led organization, uh, you know, but it wasn't. Like, about two years after it was founded, it was mostly women who were, in, who were running and in leadership positions as well. Okay, good job on the pop quiz, you guys. So uh, I, I want to give a brief context uh, about the history, you know, the factors leading to the birth of the party, and then try to get more into some of the community service programs. So some of the major events leading up The establishment of this organization. By the way, it was established in October of 1966 in Oakland, California, um, right in the wake of the assassination of Malcolm X the, the year prior. This is also a time when there's a lot of racial violence in cities across the country. We have uh, lots of rebellion. And this was just six days after Johnson, President Johnson, signed the Voting Rights Act into law. So even while progressive legislation was being passed, um, it you know it didn't solve things. It, there was still a lot, uh, a lot of tension in the country. So that's part of the story. Uh, a lot of young people in these these big cities didn't feel like the work that the Southern civil rights movement leaders were doing in the South, they didn't feel like it was really helping in their situations in places like Oakland. So this growing uh, frustration and disillusionment. Alright, so who's in this who's at the forefront of this? King, Martin Luther King Jr. and who's this? Stokely. Yeah, Stokely Carmichael. Uh, he was a leader of the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, uh, one of the student led organizations in the South. Um, so, anybody, has anyone seen this photo before? This is a photo of these two leaders who uh, at different moments had pretty different visions for the black freedom struggle, right? We know that King really adhered to direct, you know, nonviolent direct action, which we just talked about in my class yesterday. Stokely began with that philosophy when he joined SNCC, but increasingly he moved away from it. So this is a moment during a uh, Rights March in the South um, that was organized by somebody named James Meredith, who was the first black man to be admitted to the University of Mississippi. They were testing the segregation laws in the South. So a number of leaders of the civil rights movement uh, participated in this. SNCC was there, Congress of Racial Equality was there. He came and he also had. Bodyguards with him, armed bodyguards, which is one of the rare times that he did that in public. Um, but I, I put this photo up here to highlight a pivotal moment in the movement when people are having, you know, uh, louder and louder conversations about how useful it is nonviolent direct action for you know, leading to real change. Um, this is the moment where Stokely Carmichael.
Michael utters this phrase, Black Power. It's not the first time somebody says the phrase or uses it, but it's the moment when the movement increasingly, a lot more and more people increasingly uh, embrace this slogan as kind of a, a rallying cry for the movement, especially young people. People didn't really know what it meant at the time. It was vague. People were scared of it. Uh, it came across as kind of militant, violent sounding to, to certain groups, including the NAACP. They, you know, members of the NAACP called it reverse discrimination. Um, so there wasn't a clear definition at the time. King didn't like it, but he saw that young people. But the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee and the Congress of Racial Equality at this moment embraced it. They, they said, you know, this nonviolent direct action is not really as effective as we would like it to be. Um, so the Panthers are born at this moment, the Black Panther Party. Interesting, like, on this article, and I know it's a lot of text on this, um, but this was published in 66, the end of 66. So the same year as that march, it was so good, Carmichael, you know, started talking about black, black power. And this is documenting a strike by sanitation workers in Bakersfield, uh, demanding better pay, better working conditions. And one of the wives of the strikers down here she says, we've been having nothing but black slavery here. It's about time we got some black power, whatever that is. So even that quickly, this this phrase, this slogan, uh, made its way into Bakersfield. I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay. The other thing, uh, you know, Johnson uh, established all these great society programs to help alleviate, um, you know, to help alleviate poverty in low-income cities, uh, particularly made, you know, cities where there were a lot of people of color living there, including Oakland, right? Um, but these programs were always reaching the people who needed the support the most, the resources. There wasn't enough funding from the federal government, and it wasn't being allocated easily. So the Panthers, the people who would go on to establish the party, said that, you know, this war on poverty really is not We need to do something. So this was really one of the major pushes that led to Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, the co-founders of the party, to establish. By the way, Bobby Steele is still alive. He's still out there talking about the party uh, in Oakland. He's pretty active. This is what was the initial headquarters of the party on Martin Luther King Jr. Way in the West Oakland. It's now a bakery. They have really good treats. I really recommend it. <laughs> But it's cool because they've got like, you know, history inside uh, documenting the origins of the party. This is MLK right here. Okay, so I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the ideology. I will say, you know, yes, it was a socialist organization. They were fighting anti-black racism, but they were also even more so fighting um, class inequality. So the political thinkers that they read and studied included people like Mao, uh, Che Guevara, Grant Fanon, um, and they, you know, part of their political education involved in reading this literature. Oh, and of course, of course, Marx, that's where the band's name, the one thing, comes from uh, as a Marxist term. 
Okay. What's the Panther, Black Panther Party exclusive to black people? Do you have to be black to be a member? No. It was mostly black, but not exclusively. It didn't, it didn't practice black separatism. It was an like interracial party. So this is their, what they call their 10-point program, the things that they were demanding from the federal government. And this is kind of the basis of their uh, community survival programs that they organized around. Better quality housing employment, uh, their public school systems that actually taught students about black history, um, and obviously into police brutality. Okay. I gotta speed up here. This is a list uh, of the, the main Black Panther chapters throughout the country. I've got a couple more slides of it, but you can see bigger skills as February 68 is when it started. Okay, sorry guys. Let me, this is the, the, the cover of their first issue, the first issue of their newspaper. They had a weekly newspaper. Um, and originally it started as a platform to document cases of, of police brutality in Oakland. That's how they kind of you know, raised public awareness about this issue. They mobilized around it. Okay, so this is their first community survival program. This is the free breakfast for school children program. So I want to spend a little bit of time as these parties were growing. Uh, the, as the, 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 the party was growing, it was opening chapters in major cities all over the country. Um, by 1969, by, 19, by the end of 1968, it had already opened over 20 chapters in, in cities across the country. So it grew fast, and part of that was because they had that newspaper. And that's how people heard about the party. They didn't have a problem recruiting people into the party because people found out about it by word of mouth and through the newspaper. Young people who wanted to become active in their communities would call the headquarters and say, hey, I live in this part of the country, how can I join? And the party would open new offices in those places, those various places. Recruitment was not a problem. People were drawn to the group. By the way, what was the first city outside of California to open a Black Panther office? Any guesses? Huh? Chicago? Oh, I thought I heard someone say Chicago. That's a good guess. You'll never guess. It makes no sense because it never had a huge black company. Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> no, but they did have one. Oh, no. I was <laughs> about to guess. Context blue too, yeah. Seattle, Washington. My hometown. First, the first chapter outside of California. <coughs> okay. So, I'm going to keep an eye on. Are we doing okay? Okay. All right. Um, so the party opened in 1966. By 68, it's really putting more and more of its energy into the community, community service programs. Whereas before, it was really, you know, most of its energy was going into the fight against police brutality. Totally, uh, yeah. Okay, I thought it'll come back to me. 
they, they never abandoned that, but now they're putting more and more of their funding and resources and volunteer labor into these programs. So the first one that they opened was a prerequisite for school children program. This opened in a church in West Oakland, and it really reflected, again, uh, the limits and many of the sort of say that they In January 1969, its first free breakfast program was opened in a church in West Oakland, as I mentioned. It was hugely successful uh, with participation mushrooming from 11 children on the first day to 135 children by the end of the week. Uh, a typical day of this, this service, you had volunteers coming in between 6 a.m. and 6.30, um, people arriving at the headquarters to load and deliver food, while volunteers, which mainly included sisters and mothers of local communities, uh, would gather on sites and prepare the meals for, for the kids before they were transported to school. So local churches house most of these breakfast programs, uh, as, as well as schools, uh, community centers, even some families hosted them in, in their homes. So anybody with available space was willing to host the, the party. Um, that, that all helped make it happen. If you're wondering what they were a lot of it was bacon, eggs, grits, toast, milk, hotcakes, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, all of it was done through the volunteer work. So the people facilitating these services were paid. They were funded through local donations. And eventually the party um, started writing grants, uh, trying to get grant money, and they were successful. Okay, so by the summer of 1969, now I'm out of time, uh, the party estimated that it was feeding 10,000 children a free breakfast every day. That's a lot. Every day. It, it, was, it just shows, you know, the need for these, these programs. And the interesting thing about this breakfast program is that the federal government caught sight of it. And it started increasing its federal food programs for children. I'm looking at what the pamphlet is. So it started allocating more and more funding for food, uh, free food, free lunch programs for kids. So I have so many more slides, but <laughs> unfortunately, uh, I don't want to go over time too much longer. So. You know, the party, it was pretty long lasting. It lasted until 1982. Things like government repression, internal disputes, lack of volunteers, lack of, lack of resources led to its end in 1982. But, um, you know, we still see the legacy of this. All right, thank you guys. like remind me of part two. Yes.
Thank you so much. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> really informative and fascinating. I didn't know most of that. So, Lori, do you want to come on up and you and Karen take any questions? So, 4,000 acres is a lot of land. Where did the money come from? How did they end up getting that much land at the bottom of the lake? So the colonel was fairly well off to start off with, and then in partnership with um, when William Payne went to Pasadena, he was he actually went into the real estate business because he couldn't get a teaching credential in California. He didn't have California teaching experience, even though he had taught extensively in Ohio and West Virginia. Um, and so, you know, really it was the partnership of those men, and then they would sell the tracts of land and use that money you know, kind of in partnership with the Pacific Farming Company and a man named John O'Brien. Um, they didn't sell every tract of land, but yeah. Um, in the historic district, it's sort of what you would see in Old West sort of TV shows where there's, you know, a school here and then a quarter mile away, here's somebody's house and, you know, that kind of thing. So it wasn't neighborhoods like we're used to where houses were just right next to each other. Hi, um, where in the conversation was Allensworth amongst other African American leaders and intellectuals at the time? Like, did other like Southern sort of African American newspapers and journals talk about Allensworth? Yes. So he, uh, as Dr. Dodd has pointed out, he was probably in the top twenty-five of well-known African Americans for in his generation during that time period. And he followed kind of the ideas of Booker T. Washington as opposed to W. E. B. Du Bois where, you know, kind of a separatist more of a movement than trying to acculturate into the larger um, community. So you mentioned that uh, he opened a restaurant in San Luis with his brother. So did he eventually go back uh, to meet his family, his mother? Uh, so his wife? mother, um, I can't remember where she passed away, but before he came out to California, she and his um, firstborn, which was a son, they passed away within a couple of weeks of each other. So again, there's additional research that we need to do. It would be, I'm assuming that they died of some illness that was sort of rampant at the time that impacted the elderly and um, the younger. But his, to our knowledge, his mother never came out to California or any of that. So he was traveling around the country with his family being stationed at these various posts. Um, and his mother pretty much stayed put in Kentucky. Yeah, uh, for Dr. Garsha, um, what other additional Bakersfield research are we doing uh, as well as the Black Panther Party and their programs that they might have had here in the city? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I just started researching the local uh, ties to the party because um, my work focuses on the Bay Area chapters. I was just saying, as I was telling Emerson the other day, and it's just like, just hints, random hints of the party's presence here, um, you know, it did work at some points with the NAACP in its fight against police brutality, and I know there's a NAACP chapter here that's pretty old, so I wonder if there was any collaboration there. Um, it's kind of like six degrees of separation from, like, the older historical figures who influence the Panthers who have connections to other groups and organizations in Bakersfield. I'm still I'm still figuring it out. And there are other ties which are interesting. The Hall family, um, Terea Hall Pittman went to Berkeley and was instrumental in getting the NAACP started up in Oakland. Um, and then she has a sister Farisita who was famous artist and another sister whose name is escaping me right now, but you know, it's kind of interesting those ties between Bakersfield and Oakland and then Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Bakersfield and marched from um, the park at 4th Street over to, um, I believe it was Harvey Auditorium where he spoke. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the I was really fascinated about the Black Panther Party's newspaper, and I wondered if you had some time and what did you find, and how could we access that to the Oh, that's a great question. So, parts of it are 
are available online. I mean, it was, you know, originally it started as a bi-weekly um, newspaper, but quickly after it became a weekly newspaper, so and they published almost until 1982 with the Carnegie Union. So there's over 500 issues of it. There's a lot. If you search hard enough, you can find most of the digital copies of it online. Um, but, you know, it kind of reflected the party's political trajectory. So in the beginning, it was a lot of documentation of police violence against local black residents. Um, as the party increased its community programs, that became the focus. It had an international section on what other, like, uh, independent movements were happening around the world. It, you know, party leaders traveled a lot, so they would bring, report back what they learned. Um, and, then, and then the party started nominating candidates for local policies, so they started writing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, do you know if, um, do you know if the Black Panther Party had any children that were In Bakersfield? Yeah. I don't know. I'm super curious. I don't know what I I'm just early on in the research process there. Um, I would imagine they had a, a children's breakfast program here in Pedwalking and almost every chapter. But when I find out I'll, I'll let you know Luke. <laughs> the other thing, sorry, I wanted to follow up. Olivia is that at a certain point the Black Panther Party newspaper was the most widely read black newspaper in the country. Yeah, I believe it was in 1969. So a lot of people were reading. Yes. So um, I know you didn't talk about it, but we do know that some of the Black Panther parties went to Cuba. Are you or have you done any research on them? Uh, like the, some of the members? The members, yeah, that uh, escaped to Cuba once you know the police were after them. I mean, that's not a focus of my research. I know that, like, Asada Shakur, who was like uh, plenty of Tupac, not biologically related, um, but he was close to her. She's still living in exile. There are still still flip exiles all over the world. Um, and then of course Eldridge Cleaver and other leader spent time in Cuba for a while. But it's not it's I can I can give you a reading recommendations on it if you're curious. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I had a question from this where I found uh, Colonel Allen's work history so fascinating and rich. And, uh, and I don't know for whatever reason when you were talking about entrepreneurs, it made me think of Black Wall Street uh, further later on in the years. Is it, it, could you argue that that at the time, without saying or implying putting these, these pioneers in a bubble, that during that period there was just so many that wanted so bad to, to create communities where the Blacks could, could feel more self-determined? There were not only black communities, so there were other communities, including in Bakersfield, so as early as the mid-1880s, um, the Kern County Land Company recruited from the south to have blacks come out because they thought they'll be good at picking cotton, which is, you know, fairly racist sentiment anyway, but they put them on a, um, an area south of town, which at the time it was called Kern Island, the road, but we know it now as South H Street. Um, and so they lived there, they would sign a one year contract, they were given housing, they were given a certain amount of food, and um, a lot of the early pioneers of Bakersfield, the African American pioneers, came out during that time period, including the McClanahans, the Hall family, the Pinkney family. Um, so a lot of those you know, can be traced to that time period. But there were African Americans uh, in this area as early, at least that we can find records of, as the 1860 census from Tulare up at uh, near Fort Tejon. So um, the entrepreneurs, you know, they were looking for opportunity and 
trying to escape discrimination. And if you look at some of these people's lives, you know, if you're divorced in 1909 and you've got children or you're a widow, your opportunities aren't tremendous. But in a community like Allensworth, you have the first, you know, store that's open or you're able to be the librarian. And so it's really, you know, provided a lot of opportunities for some of the people that live there. Yes. Um, this is more of a fun fact, kind of, but um, Marvel Comics, they base the X-Men off the Black Panthers, the Black Panthers, um, and the main two characters are based off Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, and they would use it to like, spread awareness of the, the movement that has always affected in the United States. And they were trying to do it in a positive way to spread awareness of like, what they were fighting for. I know that a lot of people have histories for the Black Panther members, founders, and more. Is there any project, or is the State Parks pursued oral histories of I mean, even children of Allensworth residents who moved to other places and tried to? I mean, you mentioned that a lot left. Uh, and there aren't really any there now. Uh, but is there one? So we do have quite a few. Uh, by quite a few, and it's kind of you know relative, but we have about ten to a dozen um, oral histories of pioneers that you know were taken shortly after the park was created, so in the 70s, and then some even later into when 2008 was the centennial of the founding of the town, so they had a big celebration. We were able to interview um, descendants, but there was a woman that um, was a longtime member of the Kern County Historical Society who. Her mother grew up in Allensworth, and she lived there for a while. Her name was Josephine Triplett. She passed away just a couple of years ago. But um, I was lucky enough when I was the curator of the Kern County Museum to take a field trip, and she was on that field trip um, to Allensworth, and so it was great to hear her memories. Um, so we do have some oral histories, and we're working um, on a project called Relevancy and History between California State Parks and. Yeah. Um, Cal State Mayor Shill and Dr. Rod, Dodd is the one that's heading up that program. And we're looking at creating an archive of this material that will be housed in the Historical Research Center here at Cal State Bakersfield. So if people want to do research, they would be able to do that. And then also, um, the history curator for the California African American Museum, her name is Susan Anderson, and she's reached out to me. Uh, because of my work at the Kern County Museum, she would really like to do exhibit on the African American history in Bakersfield. So it's fantastic to hear that there was a Black Panther uh, chapter here in Bakersfield, because that I did not know. Uh, you know, really the collection of the museum goes up to maybe the 50s predominantly, and a little bit maybe into the 60s. But um, So, you know, it's something that we're uh, looking at being able to do. And then they would be here in Bakersfield that it would be exhibited. So that was really interesting. I'm glad you mentioned that, because I was going to ask if uh, Professor Dodd, if you want to just say a sentence or two about the grant that, that you have working with Gloria for the state, for the state parks and how that's involved in CSUD's community. Yeah, we've uh, we incorporated it with the, uh, the public history class last fall. We did a field trip up there and uh, Dallasworth. Yeah, Dallasworth and uh, Lori Weir came a couple of times. We did the unit on interpretation. We're going to be doing that again this fall, kind of exposing students to historical interpretation in the context of um, Allensworth State Historic Park. And then I've also uh, uh, hired a student assistant, uh, Ricardo Gonget, uh, who's here. And uh, he's been doing extensive, and I must say very fast and efficient, uh, newspaper research accumulating a uh, uh, very large uh, archive of newspaper clippings from Southern San Joaquin Valley newspapers, LA, Oakland, San Francisco, uh, the California Eagle, where uh, big articles and even uh, you know, classified ads uh, for Bakersfield. So there's a lot of uh, information there that's going to be very useful uh, to the future. So those have been the main thrusts of the, uh, of the project so far. Okay, well, 